Hey, this is Don from Padlock Technologies again with another video. Today we're going to talk about Sassy. As you can see by the shirt, uh, you'll love my Sassy attitude. <laughs> Play on words here. Um, now, I'm going to say this is D Cloud, by the way. Um, I do not have the full console yet. I am working on getting that so I can give you a more in depth video of all the functionalities. But I'm just going to show you the Secure Access console and I'm going to tell you each component. Uh, by memory since I've deployed this thing so many times um, in my lab and, and just deployed it period kind of know everything about Cisco secure access also know some things that are not documented about Cisco secure access that I was working in the back end with Cisco uh, and trying to get their documentation a little better so here's what the console looks like obviously this is not real data you see that thing keep clicking on workflows for workflows because they want me to click on workflows but workflows are not what we're gonna do. Uh, usually, if I were to set this up for you, I would do it from scratch without using the workflows. Workflows are typically for people that are just getting into secure access, don't really know anything about how to deploy it, and they're just gonna let Cisco do it for them using the workflows. So let's start with the top left here. The overview is basically the overview of what has gone through the SASE application. Right now, you can see on the right-hand side, we have branch traffic, RAVPN traffic, browser-based ZTNA traffic, and client-based ZTNA, ZTNA traffic. The browser base is just exactly what it is. You went to the browser, you signed in, and that's the traffic going through there. The client base is using the ZTNA module that is on the secure client that you need to install. Um, and that actually prompts you when you try to go to an application, it will prompt you in a secure client saying, hey, you need to sign in first. Now you can use Duo or Azure. Uh, when I when I do it, I usually just use Azure ID. It's a little easier. Um, plus you don't need to now buy Duo, but if you already have Duo, I suggest you use Duo because you can also do a couple other things when it comes to uh, posturing devices. Security, so security events, top security events. So you can see this is a lot similar to uh, Umbrella a little bit, but again, this is an Umbrella 2.0. These are gonna be your security events of your requests. Usually this is gonna be DNS requests and stuff that were blocked. And then you have web traffic as well. Down here with the users and groups, you can kind of see if you're doing, if you integrated your users appropriately. Now you have three versions or three ways to uh, put users or import users in the secure access. It's the AD connector, which is just like umbrella AD connector. You can use IDP so you can log directly into your IDP and scrape users from there. If you are someone that does not have on-prem AD and then you can do a copy and paste of a CSV file. That is the last method that you want to use to import users. Either use the AD connector if you have on-prem AD or go into the IDP directly and just put the users in there. So of course, they're gonna see your users down here by request, and then you're gonna see the traffic. Some of them are VPN connections. These are ZTNA authorization events, so it's either gonna be browser-based or uh, uh, module-based. You have your private resources, things that are being accessed, things that are being blocked, how they're being accessed, either gonna be client or client-less, which is browser versus ZTNA. You see they're really pushing the ZTNA stuff here, right? So this is your basic overview or stuff. Um, now for connect, since I can't click in it, I can tell you from memory. So connect is going to be your initial uh, setup. So this is going to be your backhaul tunnels, your user connectivity uh, settings, which is RE VPN basically, and stuff like that. It's going to be configuring your DNS there. You have to do connect first, really, because if you don't create your backhaul tunnels, none of this matters. If you don't have your RCs, none of this matters because you won't be able to get into your private resources if you don't know how to get to them, right? And in this connect stage, what's really important here, and this is really important in secure access period, is you need to have local DNS, right? You need to tell secure access what your local DNS server is, because when you create private resources, if you wanna do ZTNA, which is either browser or module based, it's going to be FQDN base. You cannot use an IP address to do ZTNA. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so once you put the FQDN there, well, it needs to know now, how do I, where do I go to resolve this internal FQDN to a IP address? Well, now you need to configure DNS and you're gonna configure that in the connect stage. I'm hoping to get this console to really drive this point home so you can really see it from scratch because dCloud gives you 
an overview, but it doesn't give you from an engineering, from a deployment standpoint, you can't, I can't really express the use cases and the beauty of this platform without actually having the console here in full detail. Now, resources, resources are where you're going to, you're going to create your web resources and your private resources. Now the web resources is the things that you're going to do in your access control policy. If you're trying to get people to not go to certain sites and stuff like that, right? You have that type of stuff there, basic, just like umbrella. Now the key here is the inbound stuff is your private resources. This is where you're going to tell secure access what your private resources are. And then, you know, FQDN are, you know, IP address if you want to do that. I would suggest you do FQDN if you have local DNS already configured. But this is where you're going to create your private resources. Those can be, you know, a web server, FTP server, stuff like that, right? And then you're going to use those resources in your ACPs, right? So if you if you create something like a ICE server for some reason, or you know, let's say an FTP server, and you call it FTP.plt.com, right? So you have your local DNS is going to resolve that through FQDN. Now in the private resources, you're going to give the IP address or the FQDN and what ports are allowed. Right now, this is a key difference because in the ACP, when you do your rule, you're going to, you can say like any to FTP and then you're going to log it right now. When you do any to FTP, it's going to look at that private resource and say, okay, you're going to go to FTP, but what ports are you allowed to go to? Obviously, you'll just do it on the FTP ports. It doesn't mean, hey, go to FTP.plt.com for all ports. That's not going to happen, right? So your resources is where you're going to create your private resources or your web resources. Now, there's a couple other things in there as well. Again, once I get the console, I can show you that stuff too. And then you have secure. So secure is where you're going to have your access control policy, which is the policy that controls all right all the traffic goes through that all you know traffic enforcement goes through your access control policy you're also going to have things like um your threat con your, your your threat content categories your couple other policies just like you know um umbrella where you have your web policy your firewall policy stuff like that it's all condensed into one policy now so it's your just normal acp but things like your threat control things like um SSL decryption stuff, your list, all that's going to fall into secure. So when you want to actually do some securing of assets all over the globe using secure access, you're going to do it via secure. And then that's going to tie in your resources that you created in resources, right? So all your rules are going to go through here. You can do things like RBI, which is remote browser, remote browser isolation, which is running a browser, not on the local machine itself, but it's going to run into it. It's going to be a container containerized version of a web page or your web browser. And you'll browse through there and you have your certain use case there. And that's usually to prevent drive by malware. Then last but not least is the monitor function. So if you're used to umbrella, it's the same thing. Basically you go to monitoring and you can look at all traffic, DNS, um, web, you can look at identities and all that good stuff. That's actually trying to get traffic and going through Cisco secure access. That's Cisco secure access in a nutshell. Now admin obviously is when you want to add more admin accounts and workflow is just, Hey, how do you configure certain features it walks you through it right so if you never deployed this before just like i just rattled all that stuff off the top of my head because i've deployed it before if you've never deployed before you're going to go through workflow for that right but that's cisco secure access in a nutshell and since it's blinking i'm going to click workflow so you can see what i'm talking about so we click workflows this is basically what it's going to send you to connect your organization which is your backhaul tunnels or your RCs, then secure resources. This is where you're gonna create your, you know, posture profiles. Now your posture profiles are strictly for Cisco secure, secure access posture profiles. This is totally different from ICE posture. Now, the beauty of Cisco secure access is when you start doing VPN as a service, you can actually tie in ICE and then have ICE do the profiling and not secure access doing a profiling. Now your endpoint profiles here are going to be things for like ZTNA and stuff like that. If you want to do ZTNA, you're going to tie a posture profile to it. And it's very limited in terms of what you can posture on 
secure access, right? Which is, I think it's disencryption, antivirus, and two other things, whether it's gonna be Mac for, or Windows. Then there's connect end users, which this is gonna fall into. So I'll say this, configure infrastructure and configure end user connectivity, that maps to the connect function here, over here. The secure resources and access ties to resource and secure. So this is what the resources again is gonna say, hey, create a private resource or a web resource, and then secure is going to be uh, your ACP. And the thing in the ACP, you have two type of rules. You have an internet rule, and then you have a private resource rule. Your private resource rule correlates to your private resource, right? And then your web resource or your internet-based rule correlates to your internet resource that you create, if you create one. So that could be like, hey, we want to prevent people from going to all the bad sites. And you know what those bad sites are. I don't need to say them here. Um, so you can create a rule that's deny traffic to these categories, right? And again, once I get the, the console here, I will actually go through this from an engineering deployment standpoint. This is kind of a overview. So you get some value in this video, but you won't get as much value in this video as when I show you like what it looks like further down the road. Like, okay, this is what, you know, the end user policy looks like. Here's where, you know, the AD connector ties in. Hey, here's where you create API keys so that you can download VAs and put that in your environment. So now you can do DNS policies on top of your web policies. Cause again, you don't have a separate DNS policy. Remember in Umbrella in the last video I showed you was DNS, firewall, and web. So you don't have that anymore. You have one ACP, which has everything in it. And then you have um, DNS that looks a little bit different because there's a certain way that you got to configure a policy that doesn't have SSL decryption. And then magically that turns into a DNS policy. But I'll explain that a little bit later. So let's just click on this. So if I click infrastructure, here's your network tunnels. Again, your network tunnels are going to be BGP are static. So we click in here since we're going through the workflow. This is what this will look like. So this connector group is your resource connectors. If you have a resource connector, now you can tie a private resource to a resource connector. And then you're no longer using like normal BGP routing to get to it. You are going to the resource connector and the resource connector is acting as a proxy. So let's say if it's a web server, you're going to all your web traffic will go to the web uh, resource connector and then the resource connector resource connector will talk to your private resource and then that traffic can get proxy too. The beauty of the resource connector is you can have overlapping IPs so everybody can be in the same subnet per se in different data centers and since you tied the resource connector to that one private resource it doesn't really matter about the IP address behind it because you're not talking directly to it. So the resource connectors support overlapping IPs different from the normal BGP tunnel or the static tunnel that you're going to create because you can't do overlapping IPs when you do that method. So your network tunnels are pretty much going to be your BGP or static route tunnels that you connect to it. And then you see this tunneling mechanism here. We'll say, hey, this tunnel is, is ready to go, right? It's up and running. Now, if it's up, you're going to see green. If it's not up, it's going to be red and if there's something wrong it'll be a warning so since it's telling me to add we'll just go through this here if i click the add button this is the, how you create the tunnel group so you're going to go through this tunnel group you give it a name you select a region now you have all these regions you connected to let's do northwest since that's what it's saying and then you can pick your device type now here's all the device type you can do a rocky you can do sd-wan you can do an isr asa or ftd or other since isr is what they want you to click we'll click on that and then we'll hit next here then you got to give it a name and you got to give it a tunnel password now this is all going to be ikev2 vtis all right so if you don't know how to create a static vti and do ikev2 you're going to run into a problem with this all right and then you could do bgp over the top but you need to know how to create a static vti and then do bgp over the top then you hit next now this is where I say it can be static routing or dynamic routing. If you hit static routing, you got to tell secure access what subnets are behind this tunnel. Since they don't want you to do that, it's going to say BGP. So you hit dynamic routing, and this is where you got to put in your BGP ASN. Now, use all private ASN numbers. Do not use a public, uh, a public number. 
So you click that, as you can see, it uses a private IP address, a private ASN, then you hit save. Now, your tunnel is there and it says it's up, but technically, if you don't have the other side connected, this would not be up. Now, if you wanna see more information about it, you would click on the tunnel group, and this is all the stuff you would see. Now, by default, Secure Access creates two tunnels, right? And the two tunnels are going to be in the 169.254, I think 0.9 slash 30 and 0.5 dash 30, right? So you're gonna to have to create your tunnels based on this. Now this is doing BGP over the top. So it created the static VTI and then you do BGP over the top and then you have a primary and a secondary to go to each data center. Now, of course you're gonna have redundancy there because if one data center goes down, you lose all access to everything. So if I hit the primary one, this gives you a lot of information about, I don't know why that popped up. I guess because it's the lab, they don't want me to, or the D cloud, they don't want to show me everything. But this just gives you more information about the tunnel. As you can see, it's using, you know, AES-256, which is a, a block cipher again, and then using BGP. This is the data center. This is the peering address to the other. But again, you're not going to be using the peer address per se. You're going to be using this 169.254, 0 0.9 and 0.4. So I'm not going to go into anything else here. Uh, I could do users and groups. I'll probably do another video on users or groups. I'll use dcloud if I have to use dcloud, but I'll explain it a little bit more, a little bit more detail because this kind of masks some of the hiccups that you're going to run into when you're deploying this. Um, but this is going to go with the uh, backhaul tunnels video that I created before about this is the first thing you need to do. So this was a brief overview of Cisco Secure Access. Again, if you're looking to deploy this in your environment, there's gonna be a link in the description to, below to do a discovery call with me so we can talk about implementing this in your environment and some of the use cases here. Hopefully this was informative. This is Don from Padlock Technologies. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank <laughs> you.